One thing that we are acutely aware of is that bad news travels faster and more successfully than good news. And we might want to ask ourselves why this is the case. Not only does it, why is it that it sells better, but what is it the effect that it has on the listener that drives the audience to give more attention when we hear bad news? The short answer and the easy answer is that bad news imparts upon the listener a sense of urgency. And that sense of urgency might not only serve as a confer confirmation of biases, but also a short sugar high hit of motivation to get off the couch and live and change your life in a way that you know your conscience has been driving you towards. But the next question, and perhaps a deeper question that we're going to address today, is what is it that the newsman, what is the role that the newsman has been taking, or what is the role and the mantle that the newsman has taken on, and, and if or who did it take it from? Now, I mean, in proper podcast fans fashion, I have the answer, but we're going to work our way towards that. And if you are watching on YouTube, you'll notice that we're back in the studio. We're, uh, we're, we're, our travels are done. I'm not sitting in a garage smoking a pipe being attacked by a cat. Instead, we are back closer to our regularly scheduled program for the Redacted Culture Cast. If you want to support us and you want to give us a, a shout out, you, this is, it's always great if you share our show because that's the only way that we really... Uh, we, we really grow at scale. And the objective of this production is to Im gain a or regain an intellectual foothold within not only gun culture, but Americana a as a whole, and how we look at the problems that we face and what we think about as to be right and true and good. So if you want to support us, you can head over to redactedllc.com and pick up some of our you know, little merch items that will help us keep running and keep adding to the studio or if you just want to support us outright and join into the conversation you can head over to redactedculture.locals.com but now instead of getting to the news let's talk about the idea of news in the past we have seen cultures build themselves and surround themselves around certain roles within the community it's not good enough to say that any culture or any country or any nation is purely an economy, purely a series of worldviews, or purely a population and its environment. Rather, these things come into effect. They all play their own role in how maybe these people grow or these cultures expand or how these belief systems continue to codify within an environment. And a codified organ, a codified, in other words, it's written down, it's documented, it's a sort of a rule set or a norm that people follow by, it itself needs some sort of justification. It needs some sort of foundation. Otherwise, you end up with a miasma, a, a, a dis ever dissolving, maybe let's just call it horror show of never ending revolution. If you're going to call for revolution, you ha not only have to identify what is wrong about the current environment, but what you're going to replace it with, and that has to be a feasible outcome. Now, before we wax poetic about revolutions in the past, let's stick to the subject at hand, bad news. We are quite aware in this time, whether it's through the internet or through television or through ratings or through all the numer uh, are the all the measurings of such things, whether it was how quickly, was it a Nielsen device? Was that the one that uh, allowed people to measure how much uh, traffic was receiving radio traffic? or you had television, how, what are the ratings of a certain television show, how many people are watching it, or now we have something as simple as views on YouTube, downloads of a podcast, how many times it's been shared, how many millions of voices, or how many millions of minds are listening in to what Joe Rogan has to say about this or that problem. And media itself has dis both grown and dissolved across not only our culture in America, but across the, the world as a whole through inventions like the internet. I don't have to be signed on to a multi-million dollar media company that has to put all this time and money and billions of dollars into studios and, and antennas. I actually get to run a show from a studio as small and as simple as this one. And that issue is not the first time that we've seen the dissemination of information be challenged in the past, but what we get to see with the numbers, what we get to study from these things is not only trends, but then we have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? What does this or that trend in, a, in human society tell us about people? Now, I don't need to get into the numbers to say that bad news sells better than good news. I don't need to get into the numbers to say that the uh, the sense of urgency that it gives us 
is a great sales technique that has been exploited time and time again. Whether you want to call it conspiracy theory or criticism of the government, we've seen public institutions that are gate kept and protected in the past. We've seen as the information and the documentation comes out about the stories that they told the American public, what was told differed quite radically from the truth. But those stories, whether it was the sinking of the Lusitania or it was, uh, or, or it's been different, let's just say propaganda pieces that have driven people to war, what we've seen about those is that the urgency that the bad news told was able to make its effect before what really happened came out and was properly disseminated around the culture. The urgency that was communicated through this bad news was enough to get the desired outcome before the, let's just say the, not even fact checking, but before all of the information was made available or before the evaluations were made public. And what we have here is, is what, and what we have here and what we have here growing even deeper within what we call the new, or what we might say as the news, is not only a misapplication of what we claim that it's supposed to do, but an abuse of a sort of power. Let me explain. So let's start with the question, what is the role of the newsman and whose job did he take? Day after day, year after year, gen at least two generations of Americans have decided to either tune, uh, tune into the 5 o'clock news or listen to their favorite podcasts and their favorite radio hosts. Those radio hosts, whether it's talk radio as far as Rush Limbaugh or Pick Your Poison, Pick Your Character, Tim Pool in our day, even Joe Rogan to an extent, or whether it's CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or any of the big titles, whichever you want to choose, we've seen a social program, a social norm develop, a, a common, not even a norm, but a, a social trend that develop across multiple generations where people habitually tuned into a podcast, a platform, or a news show every day, every week, or something like that. And they go to that newscast, they go to that newscaster to get a sense of what's going on in the world. Maybe it's a local news, maybe it's an international news channel, but they're trying to figure out what's going on because they trust the person on the other side of the screen to tell them what's actually going on. And that information is, in an ideal world, is supposed to be just the facts. We've talked about, the, or we've not talked about this so specifically on this show, but we've looked at it in, we, we've seen it affect, its effect take place in print publications, where a publication is expected, whether overtly or implicitly, to distinguish between fact and opinion. If I produce a series of statistics about what happened, that is supposed to be the news, the fact. Three people were killed in a car crash today. A firefighter in the local, uh, a firefighter rescued a cat from the tree. The uh, milk prices have gone up, dr gone up drastically because of a new plague that's affecting the local economy. And these pieces of information, they're supposed to be data points, facts, are supposed to inform us so that we can make wise decisions going forward in our environment. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be in an ideal world. In an ideal world, we are, we are supposed to be able to, without great effort, distinguish between what are the opinions of the newscaster man and what he is talking about as true, he or she. Let's not be, you know, too, uh, what is it, sexist? Is that the thing today now? And this, and and what we've seen though, and what we've seen is because a, a news platform has to make money and has to keep itself functioning because we don't want pure propaganda. We don't want the entire funding of our news organization and our information dissemination pr platform to be entirely funded by the government because you, we all autom automatically assume that propaganda is bad. Um, we that 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 organization has to make money. That has to and and how have we what system have we derived it to make money? Well, it's ads or something like that. And the more views that a platform gets, the more the more views that a platform gets, the more uh let's just say leverage it has to uh put, to put that platform in front of an advertiser and make money off of it. Now this makes sense. And so well, it, it makes sense in the sense that we know how it works. We're, we're r rather intuitive that, well, when I'm watching the news, there's somebody that's getting paid, and they're getting paid by somebody who sells a product, and this is this is economy. We are if ever 
caught between the throws. On one hand, we have peer government propaganda, and on the other hand, we have the horrors of a overly corrupted version of capitalism. Pick your, you know, pick your poison. We gotta, we gotta walk between those two because we need some. We we believe that there needs to be, or that the news itself has a certain role, and we don't want it to be corrupted by either government corruption itself or money. Because you know, I can pay you to lie. It's it's liable. It's it's problem. But and so we know that news need, wants to sell more. They want to sell more. They need to get more views because if a if I'm going to continue running this this program this this company, it needs to at least keep the lights on and keep the cameras rolling and so forth. But what, then we find the a, a problem when I talk about good news. Not me. Not only me myself, but like anybody on the on 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 the internet right now. Let's just use the internet.com. I think that's what so actual justice warrior is that his channel whatever um as whatever the internet.com has helped us uh new new numerify uh you know whatever keep count check numbers on is that bad news sells better bad news sells better means more views means better a better case to argue to an advertiser to fund our project whether it's <clears throat> me or any other one and then you get some people who are capable to capable find themselves capable of funding their entire news operation on their own. Or then we see things like what Tim Pool's done over at Timcast, where his news platform is user funded. Good on him, I guess. But bad news is going to sell better than good news. And bad is since it sells better, or since it gets more views, then it's going to be incentivized. And since it's incentivized, you're going to get more of it. But that's explaining it from the outside. What is the inside? What is it? What is it that we ourselves gain from bad news? Well, we gain a sense of urgency. It when we read about, we hear about, we listen to bad news. That bad news is that bad news communicates to us that something isn't right and that we should do something about it. Maybe it's maybe it's very far over there and has nothing to do with us particularly but there because it involves people we can see some relation to it possibly happening over here example uh, current example is really easy we have the israel hamas israel gaza conflict and because that's happening over there we might feel a sense of urgency to consider what it is at home that could be susceptible to that form of terrorism violence religious war and we will we see the effects of it happening in such a catastrophic catastrophic measure over there that bad news communicates it speaks to us in a way that drives a sense of urgency even if we we live in an environment where none of the factors which pertain to that scenario over there are replicated exactly in our own i mean if i live in rural montana america i'm much less likely to be concerned about say um religious extremist domestic terrorism of a Muslim-ish variety in my area because one, there's like 50 miles between me and the next home, and two, uh, it's, you know, this is God's country. Let's just use that frame. Um, and so, but but what, it, what, it, what, what I do relate to is the fact that people might be out to do violence. <clears throat> and so that means I need to consider, well, what is my status? What is my home like? What is my environment like? And then it also, though, in not so much in a negative way, encourages one to perhaps become more aware of their immediate environment. But the sense of urgency has a the the but the sense of urgency um, is is probably the best way of explaining why good news travels faster than bad news, because good or I'm sorry, bad news travels faster than good news. Bad news is more marketable than good news because. At least for the newsman, good news does not impart an imperative to the listener. If things are well, you get to continue enjoying yourself. But there's no imperative beyond that. It's just things are well. Carry on. Moving. Next story. And that is a problem or has been in the past a problem for the newsman. So let's talk about the separation of church and state. And on its most basic level, the the idea of the separation of church and state and church and state can be considered a naive proposition. The idea, in some ways, is more 
the idea is, is in some ways is more grounded in a fear of the recreation of historical events than an understanding of what those things imply. We don't want the person who stands behind the pulpit to have the, the, the power of the sword so that not only is he telling people what is the right way to live or he is conveying that sort of information to them, he is also enforcing it with the arm of the law. We've seen we, the most classic and probably overblown example of this would be something like the Spanish Inquisition or the wars of religion that, that uh, waged across Europe for better part of a millennia. These religious conflicts, probably, I mean, you could argue much longer than that, but let's just use this millennia um, framework for it. So if the man whose responsibility it is to lead the flock, to uh, convey moral imperatives to people, also has this, let's just say, pseudo-divine right to swing the sword as well, we have recognized that whether or not as whether or not or whether we're Christians recognizing recognizing that man is fallible and so man will make problems he will he will he will insert his own corruption and this strays too much towards absolute power in within the realm of man or from something that maybe isn't as overtly Christian and tries to claim a non-religious standpoint is that we do not want the same moral imperatives we do not want the people who are are we, I'm sorry, we recognize that different people have different worldviews and they have different understandings of what is morality. And so long as we are not allowing those people to ward each other openly in our streets, we might be able to produce some sort of multiculturalism. We've talked about one of the weaknesses in multiculturalism in the past is that it has to establish a meta narrative, a meta ethic over all these different religions and all, the, all these different worldviews underneath that so long as they subscribe to this meta worldview, this, this big big tent religion, they can all get along. And that breaks down when the there are overt contradictions between those two worldviews. And if or, and one of the problems that multiculturalism has faced and will continue to face until the world is gone is that if you do not have a foundation by which your idea of getting along, in quotes, exists, you will have perpetual wars and conflicts bubbling up amongst the populations that you claim to be overarching. It's quite literally the government version of the view from above fallacy. You think that since I have no religion, I can make governing choices over all religions is a level of hubris that has come to define the West in the last century. And what you run into is the very short and obvious problem that we've gone. By what standard are you going to govern multiculturalism? Simply the whatever is good for me or whatever my hedonistic worldview demands, it falls apart quickly. Unless you have some sort of explanation, some sort of imperative which derives that individuals have rights, then you cannot have a separation of church and state because what the idea that a separation of church and state is supposed to imply is that the people, the persons whose responsibility it is to investigate, consider, and disseminate moral imperatives are not the same people who are there to enforce the rights of the individual on the state level. The role of the government, the role of the state, is supposed to be to protect and defend the rights, the basic human rights of the citizenry, whereas, the, and that is a and that is a negative, not negative in, as in bad, but that is a negative imperative, that people within that population are not allowed to tread on the rights of others. And it is the state that functions as the apparatus to protect peoples from one another, enforce that law, and then defend this, the nation against other nations. But the role of the imperative, the, the driving force, is not the state. The state defends the rights of the people, and something else informs them on how they should live. In the past, this role has been filled by the pastor. It has been filled by the priest. It's been fulfilled in some senses by the shaman or your, whatever you want to talk about. Whether you're talking about Roman times, Celtic times, Christian times, or our contemporary era, the, there is something beyond not treading on, not infringing on, or not um, offending, not just you know offenses like I feel bad, but like offending as in breaching the rights of under other people that is a minimum task a maximum but but that does not derive how we should live me waking up in the morning paying my taxes or whatever it is that i'm doing feeding my family taking care of my yard 
running this podcast or trying to fund the ex- the 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 uh, expanse of my family, feeding the home, whatever, that is not the same thing as not treading on someone's rights. If in a in a figurative a a a, um, a kind of a metaphorical statement, I me not stealing your sheep does not tell me that I should raise my own. Rather, something else informs me that I should wake up in the morning, work a job, put food on the table, take care of my family. When somebody is injured in my family, go after, look after their defense. It is not simply this idea that I should not tread on somebody else's rights that informs me that I should go do good things. One says, don't steal. The other one says, you should work, you should tithe, you should help. And that kind of gives it away. The role in history has for a long time been, not only the role, but the organization of human norms in this sense, is there's always been somebody, there's always been some role within a society, some sort of imperative driving component in a society where somebody, give it, let's just say the priest or pastor, is there to shepherd people through difficult times and to help them make difficult decisions and help them with the kind of complexities that are not that are that are specific to mankind. Who am I? What what is my role in life? How do I live rightly? How do I do the right thing? What is it that how do I understand what is the right thing to do? And then there is the other half, a a form of enforcement which says you have aggrieved this person by treading on their rights. And now we have a due a due process which allows recourse to take place. Or you have become a danger to society. And so society, not only have you become a dangerous society, but it is to, to such an extent that the society itself has to figure out a way to handle that problem. And that role, <clears throat> that role has for a long time been the pastor, the priest, the religious center of our world. But in today, that role is not only more and more, but has almost entirely been captured by the newsman. When you turn on the news, what are you listening for? Are you trying to figure out what's going on in the world? Or are you trying to figure out how you should think about it? And what are the right and wrong answers to the story? For those who are fully ingrained in the political discourse, it's not good enough to say that X person got more votes. It has to be that they should have gotten more, and it's because there's something wrong with the system. Or there are, there are bad people at work, and there you go. There's your dopamine hit, your sense of urgency, something that drives you to action. We want to be men of action, and that sense of urgency that the bad news gives us pleases that dopamine urgency, that dopamine style urgency. I'm not going to even get into biology because, uh, what is it? To quote the most recent SCOTUS nominee person, I'm not a biologist. It's not my answer to figure out what a woman is. Um, sarcasm heavily implied. But we have here is this issue, and we have this issue of, do, are we watching the news for that dopamine sense of urgency to go and do the right thing and be concerned about the thing and drive ourselves into a tizzy, worrying about the current thing, or are we, and are we using that as a cheap substitute for the moral imperative that a, let's call it religious leader, is supposed to, in a good, in a rightly ordered position, guide us through? Right, the 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 pastor, the role of the pastor is not only to just it, the role of the pastor is supposed to be quite different than the role of the newsman. So we go back to the separation of church and state. If we have a propagandistic news system, which is entirely run by the government, shouldn't they be prohibited from engaging in religious topics? But you say, dear listener, isn't that quite the opposite of what we are experiencing today? Yes, you would be correct. The newsman has replaced the pastor and the priest in our society as the one who drives the moral imperative. He has accomplished this through multiple ways. One of them is that the newsman is faster at disseminating information because if we were to be specific, how much different is it? How much different is the newsman from the uh, caricature of the how much different is the newsman from the caricature of the mega pastor TV personality? Once again, it's personality, a cult of personality. It's we are tuning into the news, whether it's uh, how often, uh, maybe it, instead of making a aggressive 
blow on this one. Let me put it this way. How often are we tuning into Tim Pool or Tucker Carlson or whoever it is that we're listening to on uh, to get our daily news? Who, how often are we, if we were honest with ourselves, are we going to them for some sort of imperative to continue making actions in our life? How often are we going to them to ask ourselves, how then shall we live? And even and 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 if if that's the case, let's let let's let's shelve that question and return to it at the end. <clears throat> One thing that we brought up about why bad news spreads faster than good news is because bad news imparts a sense of urgency, and that sense of urgency is not this. We do not get that same sense of urgency from the good news from good news, and why is that? Bad news implies that action is demanded of us, and we desire to be capable and, and effective in our environment. It implies that not only is there something that must be done, but perhaps we can have something to do with it. And even if that isn't some sort of grand world-changing political struggle, it might be as simple as changing the tires in your car or on your car or fixing your environment or remembering, hey, when was the last time I checked the brakes on the truck or when was the last time I did an update on the water heater or when was the last time I did these kind of things. And so that imperative, that dopamine hit, is the, the, good, the, it is the, the reward for receiving bad news, especially when it's not so bad that it's tragic and catastrophic to our own lives. Look no further than all the bad news that came out of Hurricane Katrina or the riots in 2020. It certainly drove quite a few people to make changes to how they live their lives. And I, be, I bet you that they how they thought about their situation after they made those changes was perhaps slightly better but also sort of a also left a little bit of a hangover because after that dopamine wore off you needed to find something new to fill that void you needed a new hit of the bad news urgency to keep you going day after day and and the reason and how we understand where or if we look at the issue with good news, good news coming from the newsman is it does it, at least it gets really suspicious if it includes some sort of imperative. What do, good news doesn't import impart an imperative on the listener, at least not for the newsman. But the church and the and the religious institutions have had an answer for that. And why hasn't that translated or has it? That is that is the that is the, the not even the million dollar question, but that is the key to this problem. Historically speaking, if we even talk about it from the from the position of the church or the Old and New Testament, when you encounter good news, your the imperative is that you praise the Lord for His goodness, because we recognize that we are wholly dependent as not only people with within a moral framework, but existence itself is at the behest of the Creator. So when we see whether it's a beautiful sunset or a, or, a, or, a, or a lovely relationship or we experience these good things in the world, we have an imperative to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for my life. Gratitude being, we are, it's been, I, I think documented is not the right way of saying it, but we've seen the effect of gratitude being an antidote, a counter effect to a sense of depression where, or a, a sense of anxiety where when we find and focus and meditate and think about what we are thankful for, and then we attribute it, that to God, it has a relax, not just relaxing as in like, it has a relaxing effect, but not relaxing in sort of the chemical sense alone, but in, in a more of a worldview sense of aligning oneself closer to the source of that which is good. We recognize that not all goodness is not all goodness comes at our fingertips, and so when we experience it, we have something to direct our gratitude towards. Whether it's a friend who gives us a gift, a letter that comes in the mail, um, the birth of a child, or the experience of Thanksgiving over um, our financial situation, if we attribute it miscorrectly, maybe to our own sense of goodness, does it not it does it not corrupt that that thing that we are thankful for? Rather, according to orthodoxy, in the sense, right thinking, right living, we are supposed to, right thinking, orthodoxy doctrine, or ortho right or, or classic, orthodoxy is to direct it to God, to the source of goodness itself. And so 
the where where the newsman in this scenario has failed is it has it it has he has in the in the past failed to impart an imperative for the listener in the presence of good news but is that even the case no not entirely in today's age we see this thing trying to replicate itself in culture without that foundation and we see it in the use of the word affirmation not is it not only is it not good enough to tolerate certain trends beliefs arguments ideas within our society even behaviors no we must affirm them we must praise the goodness of those things look no further than blm and the lgbtq plus scenario that we're facing in this world which both comically have a similar source the not comically tragically not even in the greeks closer to the greek sense um, but we have this issue where I can't simply tolerate something that's different than my worldview. I have to affirm it. I have to praise it. I have to say that it is good. And this is a imperative of good news that is imparted upon the listener. The newsman not only is telling you what you sh what you should be concerned about by met by talking about bad things that have happened in the world, but he is very often driving a moral imperative of what to praise not only the facts of the situation but a moral evaluation of that situation and an imperative to praise what they are claiming is good and condemn what they're claiming is bad now it would be, if it was so simple that we could condemn the idea of the news on this then we could close this book we could close this episode off really quickly with saying turn off your television stop listening to me talk shut everything down but unfortunately or maybe more correctly it, as we understand more about who we are as humans and what we believe to be right and true and good, we recognize that that is not an absolute solution. It is only a temporary solution to what seems to be a permanent problem, and that permanent problem is, in, is part of the human condition. We have a desire for urgency. We have a desire for a sense of meaning built into being alive. Be, built into being a human is a, is a need for a sense of purpose, a sense of urgency, can temporarily lift the pressure of that sense of that 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 need for meaning but if that sense of urgency as it fades must be replenished it must be replaced by a new thing to be concerned about a new problem on the horizon a new challenge and that sense of urgency can is typically most easily imparted onto the listener through bad news but it doesn't but we but as we get inundated to that constant response that constant dopamine hit of bad news we start wondering what is good in the world because it can't all be hell in, in a handbasket um, it ha there has to be something more we see good things going on and now we have to figure out what it is that we call the good even socrates and plato goes back to what is the good where do we locate the good where does it come from how do we understand it and in culture the news man, the sis, the apparatus that we are referring to as the news has not necessarily duped, but has stepped into the void where when we cast off this idea, this caricature, this four year old or fourth grade version of religion, and we cast it off. I mean, it's not really a deeply held belief if it's that easy to get rid of. Um, but it, but it, it not only has that with that being cast off, it left a void and we filled that void with the newsman. We have exchanged the day. Uh, we have exchanged daily bread for a drip line sense of urgency. If it's not good enough to feel concerned about what could happen, we must be concerned about how something is being affirmed in our environment. And thus, the separation of church and state has been corrupted in our environment alone. This is not the first time this has happened. And what is the solution? Well, I say I'm saying this is not the first time that it has happened because what we are witnessing in our day and age has been is a, is sort of a an echo, a reflection, a grander, larger scale version of what took place during the time of the Reformation. Not only was the dissemination the dissemination of the text of the Bible made more available to the average individual, and reading was becoming more encouraged, or, or whatever we want to use for that explanation, what we saw was a challenge of 
the authority system of in the uh, authority system over information because remember the priest's role is not simply to tell you that you're a good person and people love you for the way you are but to help translate and communicate metaphysical level questions what is goodness how do i do it not just how do i not be a bad person but how then should i live what is it that i am living for and and the reformation shook up that the 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 kind of prevailing worldviews of that time because it created a challenge between the individual's ability to read and interpret the scripture and the authority that was the church and for hundreds of years we saw war on all scales and all levels of society but also we saw a but we also have seen some sort of resolution to it because it didn't matter whether you were on the catholic side or the protestant side you still at least had something that you could point back to and this is where we see resolution between catholics and protestants is that while there's still going to be cultural and personal problems between these different belief systems even depending on who you are and what you believe how much variation is 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 kind of varies from person to person there was something to point back to and that is that well we believe that jesus existed that he was the son of god that he was born of the virgin mary and that he died on the cross and was buried and three days later he ra he was raised from the dead and through that salvation is imparted to people and then from there we can talk about the particulars about whether or not there's transubstantiation within the sacraments or we can get into more we can get into heavy theological conversations specifically pertaining to the christian text but at least catholics and christians have something to come back to now, if your priest is the newsman, what is it that you have in common with him other than the procreation of the species? And this is why, well, this is where the anxiety of our culture has taken root. We have replaced the priest and the pastor's role in our lives with the newsman. It's not so much that they can't both exist, but it's when we let the one play the role of the other, we have a problem. When we let the newsman play the role in our lives that the priest or the pastor is supposed to play, when we allow him to be the sort of spiritual guide of our ethics and our worldview, instead of the person who talks about the things that are taking place in our world today, then we ourselves, whether or not the newscaster or the podcaster is at fault for this, we are making the mistake. We bear responsibility for that action. Now, some newscasters and some news personalities will wax heavily into the implied moral framework of their argument but we cannot you know, and we can we can say that that's not a good thing to do but ultimately if we're going to be stand if we're going to stand up as individuals we must take on that individual responsibility for what we believe to be right and true and good we can say that this is a bad influence but we can't blame that bad influence for all of our bad actions but now here's the next question. So we know what I'm saying in this argument, in this statement, maybe I'll just state it authoritatively, which is not the strongest way to say it. The newscaster can't tell you how to live your life. And when he does, we know it's wrong. But when we do and he tells, he confirms our biases, we are more prone to follow that worldview, are we not? Is the pastor under the same barrier? We know that the newscaster is not supposed to be telling us how to live our life. The pastor has some some weight in that decision partially because it's voluntary you choose who you you choose who you um you listen to as a pastor and now the pastor speaks to the 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 sacred we're going to go back to the, the 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 medieval concept of the sacred and the profane the profane had to do with work outside the home the sacred had to do with the life inside one's soul and the life even and what how it impacted the life that a person lived the profane was the work was the world was the physical the sacred was the soul the mind the connection to god and the role of the and and, and what we, we we recognized and i think it would be foolish to think otherwise is that if something goes so far as to have an impact on our soul, would it not have an impact on our lives? In fact, great moral imperatives that re require nothing of us oftentimes leave us with a sense of meaninglessness or empty emptiness. It's true, I know it, but I don't. it doesn't mean anything to me because it doesn't require anything of me. 
It doesn't even require faith, just intellectual acknowledgement of a fact statement being true. And yet the pastor's role, the role of not only religion, but faith in this sense in our lives, is to help inform us on what is right living. And that, and that right living is the thing that drives us on the daily and in, our, in the trajectory of our lives. The newsman is supposed to give us the facts, but when he strays out of his role, he starts and he feeds that sense of urgency. He is appealing to the sense of meaning, which is only fulfilled by something deeper, something truer, something closer to the beating heart. And that is what has happened in our time. The newsman does not have orthodoxy, which he can call back on, because the very idea of a newsman establishing orthodoxy would be a state-forced religion. The very idea that the newsman would be the one who dictates what it is that is right and true and good is a betrayal of his role. And so we must correct that in our lives by perhaps when we find ourselves in a sense of anxiety, pulling away from the dopamine hit of urgency that is driving our lives on the daily and place that time spent in something richer. And for us, that is religion. That is where we deter we understand where we get a sense of morality or where rights come from or how we understand the world, not only in a scientific and physical sense, but beyond that. And that is what is and that is the antidote, the solution to the newsman replacing the priest is to reverse it in our own daily lives by our own conscious action. It doesn't mean that you abolish and you don't look at the news at all. It's that you limit it to its proper place within our lives. You don't let it control your every attitude and waking moment. If you did give into that that drug like dopamine feel of urgency and you let it control you, you'll always have to go back for more and you will become dependent on something that is imparting its worldview onto you, whether or not you are conscious of that. We might stop negotiating with it and engaging with it as an idea and start letting it dictate and change who we are. And instead, we should invest and build that foundation in something stronger than just current events, something deeper than a loose translation of current events, something that gives genuine meaning and direction. And that historically and theologically has been the role of the priest. Now, if you don't have a priest before, you don't have a pastor, you're not invested in a religious institution, I would encourage you to go to church. Um, I certainly have been failing in that department for some time. But also, if that is not available to you, or if it's even one step, read. Pick up something, read it. Read it and start asking your questions, asking yourself the questions, what is right and true and good? And what is this saying? What is right and true and good? And how do I know it? And how am I pursuing it? So in closing, this episode of the Redacted Culture Cast has been supported by you folks, the listeners, and I thank you for your time and for the encouragement that you've given us. If you want to continue supporting the channel, you can head over to our Locals page at redactedculture.locals.com, or more importantly, and certainly more importantly for us now, spread the word, share, the me share this message if you can. And I invite you to participate in conversation with our community and our peoples, because this is how we move forward. I think it was, we've heard it, or we've heard it said that politics flows downhill from culture. And where does culture come from? Culture comes from where we locate what is right and true and good. Thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you soon.